Mr. President, I come to the Senate floor to respond to a series of accusations raised by the United States Attorney of the Southern District of New York. First, I would note that this is the second superseding indictment brought forth by the government. It should be noted that all of the information presented in the superseding indictments were fully available to the government since the beginning of this process. And for that, at least a year prior to the bringing of this indictment. Which therefore begs the question, why did the government not proceed with all of these accusations from the beginning? The answer is clear to me. By filing three indictments, one in late September, a second one a few weeks later in mid-October, and a third one just last week in early January, it allows the government to keep the sensational story in the press, it poisons the jury pool, and it seeks to convict me in the court of public opinion. In so doing, the government's tactics harm not just me, but each of you, my colleagues, the political establishment, and most importantly, the electorate of New Jersey. The sensationalized allegations are now creating a rising call for my resignation, despite my innocence, and before a single piece of evidence has even been introduced in a court of law. The United States Attorney's Office is engaged not in a prosecution, but a persecution. They seek a victory, not justice. We've seen this play out with other prosecutions of public officers. Remember what happened to Senator Ted Stevens or Governor Bob McDonald. There are numerous other examples. It's an unfortunate reality, but prosecutors sometimes shoot first before they even know all the facts. It would be a shame if this venerable body does the same. So having set the stage for why this process has unfolded this way, let me deal with some of the issues starting with the latest accusation. I have received nothing, absolutely nothing, from the government of Qatar or on behalf of the government of Qatar to promote their image or their issues. The government's principal allegation of what I supposedly did for Qatar was to support a Senate resolution. This resolution was sponsored and introduced by Senator Graham and co-sponsored by 11 other bipartisan senators, posted on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee agenda and passed by voice vote. Now, what was that resolution about? The resolution sponsored by Senator Graham and 12 of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle thanked the Qatari government for assisting the United States military in evacuating American citizens and Afghan refugees from Taliban rule. How nefarious is that? Then they referenced some press release I made. Well, the press release says in one sentence, I am glad to see our friends and allies in Qatar be moral exemplars by accept accepting Afghans ultimately seeking safe haven in the United States after being forced to escape for their lives. That's the one thing it says about Qatar. The rest of it is a call for international cooperation to help protect Afghan civil society members, journalists, and others at risk of Taliban rule, something I've heard many members of the Senate at the time speak out for. Qatar has played important roles in hosting our U.S. al adid Air Force Base, the largest in the Middle East, in responding to the administration's call to supply natural gas to Europe during the Ukrainian conflict with Russia, and yes, facilitating and receiving Afghan refugees that the United States government was seeking to evacuate, among other initiatives. And most recently, they played a role in brokering the release of Israeli hostages held by Hamas. Now, like any other country, there are things that we disagree on. During the World Cup preparations, the question of labor violations took center stage. Qatar's engagement with its next door neighbor, Iran, and with Hamas have all been points of contention. And I have criticized Qatar, as I have any other country, when I felt they were falling short of their international obligations and applauded them when they have led in ways the United States and the world would commend. That give and take, that carrot and stick, that cajoling and rewarding is the essence of diplomacy. 
It is a job we all partake in every day as part of our duties in the Senate. The government seeks to use baseless conjecture, not facts, to create the connective tissue to substantiate the allegations. They show a picture of watches, but no proof of receiving any such gift. They talk about tickets to a state-sponsored event, but as we all know, members of the Senate often attend state-sponsored events. Indeed, I've seen members of the State Department, the administration, and yes, even the Justice Department attend state-sponsored events. The government fails to mention that the family member referenced to already had their own purchase tickets to the event. That's not a perk and certainly not a bribe. Finally, on this point, the suggestion that an introduction of a constituent to a Qatari investment company is illegal is not only wrong as a matter of law, it is dangerous to the important work all of us as senators do. Under the government's theory, it may be a crime for members of the Senate to make introductions to companies and constituents in their own state, to foster investments in their state, investments that create jobs and rateables and revenues and help grow the economy. Indeed, if that is a crime, then advocating for Boeing aircraft to be purchased by a foreign government, attracting a foreign chip manufacturer to your state, getting a country to buy agricultural products from your state, making technology investments, and so many other actions that members of the Congress take to attract investment and economic opportunity to their states would now be a crime. Now let me turn to the government's other outrageous accusation of conspiring to act as a foreign agent for the government of Egypt. This is an unprecedented accusation, and it has never, ever been levied against a sitting member of Congress, never, and for good reason. It opens a dangerous door for the Justice Department to take the normal engagement of members of Congress with a foreign government and to transform those engagements into a charge of being a foreign agent for that government. I want to address the accusations as they relate to me, but I don't want you to lose sight of how dangerous this precedent will be to all of you. Let me start by describing my history of taking adverse positions to the government of Egypt, my defense of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in that country, and my stinging criticism of the violations of human rights, democracy, and rule of law issues in Egypt. One fact is indisputable. Throughout my time in Congress, I have remained steadfast on the side of civil society and human rights defenders in Egypt and everywhere else in the world. If you look at my actions related to Egypt during the period described in the indictment and throughout my career, my record is clear and consistent in holding Egypt accountable for its unjust detention of American and Egyptian citizens, its human rights abuses, its deepening relationship with Russia, and efforts that would have eroded the independence, the independence of the nation's judiciary, among other concerns. In 2017, I led the writing of a bipartisan letter to President Trump expressing grave concern with the worsening situation for human rights and civil society in Egypt. That same year, I sent a letter to the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee supporting U.S. assistance to Egypt as long as Egypt adheres to the Camp David Accords and urged the Appropriations Committee to include the requirements for assistance reform strategies outlined in the Egypt Assistance Reform Act of 2013. In 2018, I urged Secretary of State Tillerson to focus more on human rights issues in Egypt and raised concerns that the electoral environment ahead of Egypt's elections at that time were not fair, free, or credible. In 2019, I met President el-Sisi, along with members of the Senate, at the Munich Security Conference, and pressed him on the level of repression inside of Egypt, warning him that it risked eroding our security cooperation and raised concerns at that time about Egypt's intention to purchase a Russian missile system. In 2020, I spoke on the Senate floor for International Women's Day and cited the cases of Mahinor el Masri, a human rights lawyer, and Ezra Abdel Fattah, a human rights activist and reporter, who were unjustly detained in Egypt for fighting for human rights, democracy, and a free press. Does any of this sound like I was on the take with Egypt? Of course not. 
But that's not all. In 2021, during this very time period that this indictment alleges I was an agent of Egypt, I placed a hold on $1.58 billion in foreign military funding to Egypt, M1A1's tank fleet, and $125 million in economic security funds. I placed that hold based on concerns I had with reference to the worsening human rights situation in Egypt and the harassment and detention of activists in general, including the detention or harassment of family members in Egypt of activists currently living in the United States. In the fall of 2021, I took an official trip to Egypt, where I forcefully raised all of these issues directly with President el-Sisi in the presence of our United States Ambassador to Egypt, as well as staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The government references this trip in its indictment, but tellingly fails to state what actually occurred and how I confronted President el-Sisi, which they know. The omission intentionally leaves a bad and unfair impression. Most recently, on a congressional delegation trip to Egypt in August of 2023, led by Senator Graham, along with nine fellow senators and two House members, I once again challenged President el-Sisi on these and other issues in the presence of my colleagues and U.S. Embassy personnel. Each and every time, I raised issues of arbitrary arrests and detentions, violations of human rights, the spanning of non-governmental organizations, and other issues in a direct challenge to President el-Sisi. Now again, when Egypt has acted in concert with U.S. interests and values, like fighting terrorism in the Sinai, or its peaceful relations with Israel, or working to improve the rights of Coptic Christians to worship as they please, I have commended Egypt's actions. But you can't challenge the leader of an authoritarian state in public and among other members of Congress and take actions adverse to their interests and at the same time serve as an agent of that same foreign government. Over my 30 years of engaging in foreign policy, I don't know of any dictator or authoritarian leader who is willing to be publicly chastised or who regards someone who dares to do so as his agent. Which brings me to the danger of what the Justice Department has created by charging a sitting member of Congress with acting as a foreign agent. The relevant Farah statute's definition of agent is broad. It includes anyone who engages in, quote, political activities, publicity services, or other certain acts at the order request or under the direction or control of a foreign principle. Applied to members of Congress, it covers anything that could in any way influence any agency or official of the United States or any section of the public within the United States as to public policy. So, when members of the Senate from agricultural states went to communist Cuba to sell rice or poultry or sugar or beef, and were told by the Castro regime that they would consider doing so, but that the senators needed to convince the U.S. administration to change U.S. law and lift the embargo and permit credit to take place for such sales, and then came back to the United States and advocated for exactly that request. Did that make him a foreign agent of Cuba? I think not. When senators travel to Israel and hear from their elected leaders requesting greater economic and defense assistance or for the replenishment of I Am Dome, did their advocacy upon return make them a foreign agent of Israel? I think not. When senators travel to the Middle East in pursuit of engaging countries to become part of the Abraham Accords and heard from Saudi Arabia that a civilian nuclear program, a mutual defense agreement, and technology transfers might be prerequisites for Saudi Arabia joining the Abraham Accords. And then they came back to the Senate to advocate for that. Were they foreign agents of the Saudi government? I think not. What if any of these examples, that country bought rice or sugar or meat from your state? What if that country purchased Boeing aircraft made in your state? Would that be a quid pro quo? What if you got contributions to your campaign from U.S. entities or individuals associated with those countries? Would that be a quid pro quo? For the government, the sky is the limit if they want to pursue you. 
What a chilling effect on the mere engagement of these conversations and inquiries would it be if the sum of those actions taken in pursuit of your fact-finding effort to inform you of what your legislative actions should be can be turned into official acts in violation of the law and not within the protection of the speech or debate clause of the Constitution. Now, some may be alarmed by what I've described, but in this case, explain it in a way by saying, but in this case, there are allegations of cash and gold bars. The problem is, is that there is no evidence of the giving or receiving of cash and gold bars. In fact, there has been and will be at trial a full explanation of what is the truth about those issues, a truth that proves I am entirely innocent of the charges. And that is the problem. Almost everyone, including my friends in the press who have reported on it, haven't read the indictment. They've only taken the government's sensational narrative of what the accusations are as truth. They haven't sought facts of the allegations. I'm innocent, and I intend to prove my innocence. Not just for me, but for the precedent this case will set for you and future members of the Senate. I am, however, alarmed that the greatest and most ardent defenders of the Constitution in this body are among the most vociferous in calling for my resignation. They would deny me due process and undermine the fundamental principle of our law that in America you are innocent into proven otherwise by a jury of your peers. Now, members of the Senate are not above the law, that they are not beneath it either. If for political expediency an indictment and its accusations are now tantamount to guilt, we have upended our system of justice in America. And when the next person or group of persons are wrongfully accused, you will not be able to claim that the constitutional guarantees of due process and innocence of proven guilty need to be observed. Now, some say that a U.S. Senator answers to a higher standard. But even then, the question of whether that standard has been violated depends not on accusations, but proof of guilt after being afforded due process beyond a reasonable doubt. Finally, let me say that I understand how the government's accusations made in the most sensational and purposely damning way possible, its misuse of the grand jury system to bring superseding indictments even though it had all the information they alleged from the beginning, can be a source of concern and content by some of my colleagues, the political establishment, and most importantly, the people of New Jersey. I get it. And I am suffering greatly as a result of what they have done. After 50 years of public service, this is not how I wanted to celebrate my golden jubilee. But I have never violated the public trust I have been a patriot for and of my country. Now, let me close by saying, I understand some of my colleagues are in tough races, and for them, this was a political calculation. Let me also say that for the administration, the political establishment, and for my detractors, it would be much easier to have me exit the scene so that an unjust deal in immigration that won't really solve our problems at the border, but that would hurt the Latino community, would be easier to be achieved or that a new deal with Iran would be more possible, or a cozying up to the Castro regime could take place, or selling F-16s to Turkey could be finalized. I get it. But I will not step aside and allow those things to happen in the name of political expediency. I have never chosen the easy path, never have, never will, and will not do so now. I simply ask for justice to be allowed to work its way. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor and observe the absence of a quorum.